Hey, music makers, I've got a special announcement and a new segment at the very end of the show, so make sure you stay tuned for a new music shout out. All right, let's get on with the program. Hey, welcome back to Make More Music, the podcast that connects people to music and one another. My name's Chris, and I'm a board-certified music therapist. If you're here for the first time, I interview different music and music-related field professionals to show you the abundance of life and career paths, because I believe that a more musical world is a better world. Today, I've got an awesome one for you. This is a special edition with one of my good friends, my good mentors. It's Rich Abonte Motes. And I always love to say Rich because... As a Filipino, um, it's funny for her because Rich is a nickname uh, that she grew up with. (laughs) Rich is actually like a wee little Filipino lady, not a guy named Rich. So uh, Rich is a music therapist. She is a Berkeley grad. She is a beast of a pianist, a beast of a vocalist, and better at guitar than um, most people who claim they're guitarists. So... I loved the fact that I got to sit down with Rich and talk about her passion project, which is this idea of musical integrity in music therapy. So um, this is going to be a really good one, whether you're a music therapist, and this is something that could be helpful for you for improving your practice, but also I think just for any musician really to think about how do I connect with the music I make. And I guess without further ado, let's hop right in to make More music with Rich Abante Motes. All right, Rich. Well, I'm so grateful to have you on here. You have played such a big role in my music therapy journey, going back all the way even to being a student. And actually, I just realized this. We did a podcast interview, and that is basically basically how we met. (laughs) That is so true. That just... That just uh, came full circle That's for me so right funny. now. funny. At conference. But um, I will link to the AMTAS <laughs> podcast <laughs> about how you can be successful at the internship fair. Oh, man. I don't even um, remember what I said, really. So All of it was definitely on brand um, <laughs> with your personality and your philosophy. <laughs> so that's good. Um But before we get into the meat of everything, it's been fun. I've started doing my rapid fire questions here at the beginning. So I want you to open up your phone or wherever you were listening to music last and pull up the last track you played. Oh, man. The last track I played was... You can elaborate if you need to, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I listened to a whole album, so it's the last track in that album. Uh, okay, what album? It's Kurt Elling. It's jazz. It's vocal jazz. And the album is This Time It's Love. And it, the last song is Every Time We Say Goodbye. It's one of my favorite tracks ever by him. Mm, Kurt. All Kurt right. Elling, yes. Um, What was that show you went to like really – Recently, Recently at the Dr. Phillips, that was yeah. I saw you post something. Yeah, that was Gregory Porter and co-headlining with Legacy. Have you heard of these people? I think you've told me of the first guy, Gregory before. Porter. So Legacy yeah. is she's really a chameleon. So she's her roots are R and B, but she's done everything so jazz. So I mean, this it's always incredible to me when it's just literally a rhythm section not even a full rhythm section just drums and bass and keyboards right and it just sounds mm-hmm. so full so it's just that kind of show and then gregory porter is jazz i mean grammy winning multi multi uh grammy nominated and has had grammys too in the jazz space he's Good amazing show. amazing amazing show i we it was probably the closest I had been to the stage. So at the Dr. Phillips at the Walt Disney yeah. Theater, which is really, really cool because that energy, you know, you just feed off of that energy. And I just love jazz so much that um, like after that show, I was in a high, obviously, and, and I was telling my husband, Matt. I was like, man, like, I just want to go back to doing more jazz. And he's like, that's what that did for you. Because for me, it just confirmed that I don't want to be a musician anymore. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> it's funny how you can have very different responses <laughs> to the same amazing thing. Yeah, she's like, that just showed me how not good enough I am. I'm like, oh, but it was amazing. And you're like, let's improvise. Yeah, let's, let's come on. Out. And so, <laughs> you know, you could probably guess it is happening. But that week following, Ben and I, my son Ben and I, who's four, were just literally scatting in the car, <laughs> just making up our own scats. And he's so funny with that. So. That's Funny good. story about that Kurt Elling album too, because um, mm-hmm. I had been listening to it probably. This is the third day that I've been listening to it straight, and uh, this morning we were listening to it on the way to drop off as I was dropping, um, driving to drop Ben off to my mother in law. And there, this one song called "Freddie Zian for Jen," which Kurt Elling's thing in his early years was he would uh, take solos of different jazz artists. Um, like either saxophone or piano, and he would put lyrics to them. And so I think Mm. that's one of these tracks. So he was doing these crazy like lines to solos, right? And it's not your regular lyrical melody. So it's very percussive and he's added lyrics to it. And then he's scatting in the middle of that. And I was, Ben had been quiet in the back and then, all of a sudden, like after this really complex line, his eyes got really big and he, you know, he's four. And whenever I play jazz, he covers his ears, but then his eyes got re- get really big and he goes, wow, this guy's a really good singer, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there you go. So that was pretty, that was pretty sweet to hear him say that. I'm like, yep, he is a really good singer. And you could be, and too, you could be too. Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's good. Um, if you were an instrument, you can make this oh, as philosophical as you want. What would you be? I would be a piano, always, um, just because there's so much depth on the piano from like a, a melodic and harmonic perspective. It's also very percussive. I mean, if you if you think. There's just a wide range to it, you know. So I, I definitely would be a piano for sure. You, you sound like you wanted to pick something else. <laughs> Why did you like sigh? No, uh, no, just sure. no. It doesn't have to be your final answer. No, just because like I, <laughs> since I'm preparing to buy a piano, I'm like, am I just mm. giving that answer because I've literally been looking at pianos and been trying them out? But I really think I'm gonna be a piano. I want to be a piano. Sweet. And you're ripping good at piano, so that makes sense. <laughs> so what is something, could be anything, that's been inspiring you recently? Oh, um, jazz, uh, faith, um, this it sounds like super cliche answers, but family, I, I've, last year, my I went to the Philippines for half work thing, half holiday thing, and then my sister and my family came here, and now we've just been talking about how we're gonna see each other again. You know, my family's in the Philippines, and so I've been thinking about that a lot. And Ben's growing up, and he t- tonight just before this, actually, we were watching like a slideshow of our our family's trip from November, and he was just talking about how much he misses them. So that inspires mm-hmm. me and keeps me. Moving forward, something to look forward to when when the days are rough, you know, and it's and it's hard to be inspired by anything. So, <laughs> yeah, but you've got these big things yeah. like faith and jazz, <laughs> yeah, and faith family, and jazz. so we'll yeah. take that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like a that's a book, faith and jazz. Faith and jazz. Uh, what is a pro tip or a hack that you practice that you feel like everybody should know about? Regarding what? Anything. I've had people tell Ugh. me how to keep their to go food warm. Oh my god! In their car. Um, that's a hard one, man. Hmm. Parenting, you just feel like you're failing at life all the time. So <laughs> yeah, so pick something that feels like a layup. Then. <laughs> um. Gosh, a hack. Uh. Dang. Oh, okay. I cooked tonight. So spaghetti sauce. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. 
I know some people are like crazy do it from scratch kind of people. I am not that person, but I'm also not like super processed. So I what I do when I make Filipino spaghetti is just buy a jar of olive oil and garlic sauce because that's easier to build depth of flavor, but not have to go like a crazy meat sauce flavor. Do you know what I'm saying? So like mm-hmm. olive oil and garlic, and then you could just start adding your own stuff. And then that makes for good spaghetti sauce without having to literally make it from scratch and and work at it for hours. So it's not black and white. You can go halfway. Exactly. It doesn't have to be all processed. <laughs> Isn't that matching who I am, really? Yeah. That, <laughs> like right smack in is, the middle. This is foreshadowing, yeah. <laughs> um. So this has been pretty easy for a lot of people, but this might be pretty hard oh. for you. What is your go-to junk food? Oh, um, a lot. And there's different categories. I know. That's exactly <laughs> why I'm Because <laughs> I don't know many people who like junk food as much as me. Oh, as you. I love junk food. You know, you've been there. Um, Chocolate-wise, Hershey's Kisses, it's just classic. You know, just like solid, easy, solid. It's right there. No, not fussy. Um, yeah, you can eat one or you can eat four. Right. You know. Yeah, you know, you get me. <laughs> um, yeah. Straight up wavy potato chips mm. with like onion dip. That that's so good. But really, my, what, what brand would you go for? At for Lay's chips? for wavy. For it's just like your basic wavy. But here's. Like if I really, if I'm having a bad day or I have the munchies or whatever, the munchies, what am I talking about? If I'm really craving junk food, my go-to would be Trader Joe's. You're going to hate this, Chris. I'm sorry. Trader Joe's salt and vinegar chips. Mm, yuck. <laughs> yeah, I know. Salt and vinegar chips. And then you match that with Hershey's Kisses or something chocolate. He like dark, dark chocolate covered pretzels. And you have one bite of the salt and vinegar chip and then a bite of the ch- chocolate. That's just amazing mm. all around. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I like that we went on like a food crawl yeah. of junk food. Um, can be anything as well. But what's a person, project, or an organization that you think deserves a shout out? A personal pro- – a, a what? A person, a, a personal project, project, or an organization. No, just like somebody that you think deserves a shout out for whatever reason. Well, I just watched Brian Shrek's um, music therapy choreography on Friday. And I feel like I've been studying like the heartbeat recordings for a while. Uh, But I mean, I just learn something new every single time. So he definitely deserves a a shout out. Yes, and he is episode six, if anybody yes. wants to go back and That's listen right. to that. That's right, yep, episode six, uh, go back. Great, yeah. I'm glad, I was telling him, I was glad that you helped us make that connection, because now I'm like in town with him, <laughs> and it's like, cool, Louisville Yeah, friend. you guys are like Louisville, you guys got beards, you're into recording. I mean, y'all could basically be the same person. Kindred spirits. Kindred spirits, That's for good. sure. good. Well, I have the pleasure of knowing you, you know, very well, working with you for a little over four years and spending a lot of time building my whole life and family down in Orlando. Mm -hmm. So you are the, what, what is the title? Director of music. Oh, thanks for promoting me, but it's program manager right now. Program manager of music therapy, but that's for your whole region of Advent Health, right? Yes, Central Florida Division. Okay, of Advent Health, Advent which Health. when I started was Florida, Florida Hospital. Hospital. Formerly known as. And yeah. So, but before we get into all the awesome things that you do through that and your master's research and all of that, take me way back to the beginning, which is probably your earliest memories. What were some of your first musical memories? Um, I know from uh, stories that my mom has told me that I started singing at two and a half and there are videos and pictures to prove it. I uh, started singing at church at two and a half, which is so weird for now that I have a kid, you know, like we know what our kids are like at two. Um, Mm -hmm. And so my mom just swore that I was singing on pitch and I was bold enough to sing. So, 
yeah, started two and started singing at two, and then started piano, formal piano lessons, I guess, at six, but had been playing by ear before that. And my musical life was solely uh, rooted and grounded in church, church music, Mm -hmm. um, up until I started um, conservatory in college. And your family is super musical too, right? What are all the things that your family... Yeah. So my dad sings and plays multiple instruments. I grew up with my dad and his uh, two brothers and my grandpa. They had a... Southern Gospel Quartet. If you can imagine, they're Filipinos that was a Southern Gospel Quartet. And so singing harmonies with them. Yeah. Um, And all of my uncles and my grandpa all played multiple instruments from piano to guitar to accordion even. So my dad had, has been in ministry for a really long time. And so when he first started a church, I would hear stories about him where he literally was the preacher and the song leader and had an accordion using to lead the congregation and singing. So that it's just surrounded me my whole life. And then my sister and I, we sang duets whenever we traveled with my dad, whenever he spoke. So it's just been around me. And then um, my uncle, my dad's, my dad's brother was the first one in the family to be formally trained. So really no one else in the family had formal music lessons until my uncle got to the conservatory. And so that's part of my influence too, before music. Yeah. Therapy. Did that change like your dynamic and how you started to interact with music or yeah. what made you decide this is for me, not just I'm a kid who sings or a kid that takes piano lessons? Well, I mean, it's, it was almost like we didn't have a choice, but not in a negative way. You know, like it, it was just there. It was yeah, just yeah, there. Yeah. It was just us. It, we were just the family that sang whenever there was a family gathering, you know? So it wasn't ever like a, oh, that's so weird that you guys are so musical. It's just everyone did it. And also, Filipino culture in general, there's music everywhere from something silly like karaoke, literally in every single corner and every single household to every school and college had um choirs that compete you know that kind of stuff so it was we were literally surrounded with music that was more normal than not like right here that's like a very oh a teenager's in a traveling choir that's like well that's just school yes (laughs) yes yes yeah but it it wasn't really i didn't grow up thinking like through high school, I didn't grow up thinking, oh, I'm going to go to college for music. Actually, that was not a thing that I was thinking about. What did you think you were going to do? I wanted to be a physician because I was actually a premature infant. I was born at 20. We don't know if it's really 26 or 28 weeks, but between between those gestational ages. And um, my parents always called me their miracle child, their miracle baby. And so I was in hospitals a lot when I was a kid, I had chronic respiratory issues, asthma. So I was in the hospital probably three times a year and in the ED every single time. So I got very close. I, I'm, I was what you would, what we would call here a frequent flyer. So I knew the mm-hmm. ED staff. I, I knew all the PED staff and I was very close to my doctor. So I thought that I wanted to be a pediatrician. Well, what kind of went along the way as far as, you know, you were learning piano, where did you start performing and where did you get this knack for sharing music out other than these family gatherings and stuff? Well, funny that you mentioned piano lessons because my sister and I started pretty much around the same time and um, she actually was better at reading music at first you know, like sight reading and and mm-hmm. really learning by reading the music. Well, I don't remember this, but my mom told me that for a while, my piano teacher didn't know that I was learning music by ear and I was just showing up and playing it by ear <laughs> until good. she started to notice. And then she took the music uh, and she took the music away and started to like really test me and found out that I wasn't 
sight reading. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to learn from from that point on. But I, I think I was gifted a lot with a good ear and playing stuff, just picking things up really quickly. When I was 11 years old, our church pianist left. And my dad, being the pastor, basically said, well, well, there's no one else, so you're going to have to play at 11 <laughs> years old in this big church with a with like a big adult choir. Um, and our choir director, he didn't care that I was 11. Um, he just cared that we needed new music every single week. And so I think that's really what trained me to sight read really well, to use my ear very good. My church at home, we sing hymns and um, – I actually, it came, it just was pouring out of me that I needed to play these chords, not the way that they were written. Like I, I don't, and I, it's hard to describe what that is now, you know, like I just figured really what I would term as reharmonization on my own mm -hmm. based on the fact that I didn't want to play just straight up triads. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And from then on, again, I, t I said like, music was basically rooted in church. I started to, as a teenager, be a part of ensembles and leading ensembles. And that really fueled my passion with sharing music and learning music with other people. Um, because at that point, if I'm being completely honest, I really wasn't doing a whole lot of secular music. I went to Christian mm -hmm. school. And so kind of the same stuff but i was listening to pop jazz here and there r&b and i could sing them but not like as a from a performing standpoint when i was 15 except kenny rogers right? well except kenny rogers you're right <laughs> yeah, we were allowed to listen to kenny rogers growing up jesus oh, really and, loves um, kenny yeah, rogers and this guy named roger whitaker or is that what his name is? You should look him up because that's like old time not even crooner i don't think i mean he'd sing like uh, fiddler on the roof type music and i thought that was so cool i just was it was awesome rebellious yeah so rebellious and so at, i graduated high school at the age of 15 and um i was gonna go to pre-med and my dad at the time said you do know you've got this music in you right like why don't you go to conservatory which is ridiculous now to think about it that he stopped me from being a physician and wanted me to be a musician yeah yeah um wild so then um i at that point i had never really been super classically trained on in voice and i knew that i didn't want to spend eight hours a day practicing piano so mm -hmm. what i did was i signed up for voice classical voice lessons a semester before so i could audition and that's what got me into the conservatory. They didn't know what to do with me because I was 15. And usually in the conservatory, they want your voice to be mature. And so I was pretty young. They accepted your me. baby and, genius. <laughs> and that's when I think this whole world started opening up to me about, oh, gosh, like there's the, the – it's kind of like the big or small – Fit, big fish in small pond kind of situation, yes. right? And then mm -hmm. you go out in the conservatory and you're like, whoa, all these people that have been learning classical music for all their lives, competing in classical music. So I knew I could, I was able to do it, but I wasn't as passionate about classical music as my peers. Um, and I was being trained as a mezzo-soprano and I, I just, there was something about it that I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the, th the theory part of it and the making classical music together. But I was also at that point was starting to get really get into jazz. Like I, I had discovered in my college years, Ella Fitzgerald, um, uh, Duke Ellington. And I, this is back in the day when we had tapes, you know, so I didn't really have tapes of these people, but in the music library we did. And so I was spending hours in the music library listening to jazz because it just fascinated me. And then I, for the first time ever really in my life, I signed up for the one jazz class at the conservatory hmm. um, as the only female ended up being the keyboard player and the singer. And that's when I, it, there's just something so, um, challenging and fulfilling being in a room 
improvising with other people, you know, and like, and then playing these rich chords. So that's when I first started to feel that magic when you're playing with other people, not like in a, you know, the piece exactly, this is how we're all going to play it, or we all have our parts that we're going to play exactly the way it is. So that's really what opened my eyes up a lot to more contemporary styles of music and more specifically jazz. Um, at what point did music therapy just collide into your, your life there in college? Yeah. So th- Cause it took you all the way to the U S you moved to Boston. Right. Changed my life. So that completely. was a big change. Yeah. 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 It was right around that. Wait, st- what were you thinking you would do? Sorry. what did you, what were you thinking you would do after this degree? Well, that's an interesting question because conservatory you you don't leave in four years typically you know like it's a long Mm. time of training and especially since I started at 15 they really were invested in training me until my voice fully matured but at some point I had started to have these existential questions about do I really want to be an opera singer so in the Philippines and in the program that I was in, all the performance majors were required to take 12 credits of music education classes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so I took my music education classes and experienced my first classroom, a music classroom teaching with uh, like kindergartners and first graders. And that like changed my life. I was like, I, and I, may, I thought that maybe it was because I wanted to be a pediatrician. But I really enjoyed Mm -hmm. interacting with kids. I really enjoyed making music with kids. I mean, I was teaching them simple music theory. But at the end of the day, we were making music and having fun. And so I actually went to my professor, my vice professor, and said, look, I think I want to be a music ed major (laughs) because I – I'm really enjoying teaching and the music ed department had actually wanted to offer me a job as a performance major. And so Hmm. at that time, my voice professor, who I dearly, dearly love, but this is just the culture in classical conservatory. So she said, what are you doing with your life? You're already a performance major. Do you know how many people would want to be in your spot who can't get into a be a performance major. And so I felt this huge pressure um, to just stay, just, you know, stick, stick to my program. But I knew that that's not As what a I what, would... like 17 year old or yeah, something? At yeah. That yeah. Point. Isn't that crazy? Be- being trained as a mezzo soprano and basically being told, no, it's not good enough for you to be a music ed major. Like you're wasting your time if you are, which at that point, I was starting to build this philosophy in my mind of, well, music educators need to be the best musicians. So if we're going to influence the next generation Mm -hmm. of musicians, you know. Um, And so that actually was instrumental in changing the track of my, of conservatory for me. At that point, I started to really be burnt out a lot because then I was like, well, what am I going to do now? You know, like, is this Mm -hmm. what I'm going to do? Just practice and rehearse and perform operas. And I mean, that's not even what I do in real life. And so Mm -hmm. at that same time is when I discovered that jazz class. And at that same, around that same time, I was already teaching in our church. Our church had a private school and I was already teaching music from all the, all the grades. So choirs, I formed choirs and ensembles that competed in the, national Christian school organization competition. So I was coaching a lot. Um, So I was leaving the conservatory one day to go ahead to rehearsal. And I saw this small sign, very like you would have missed it if you were just walking by and not paying attention. Just this small eight and a half by 11 sign that said music therapy at room HA whatever. Yeah. And I was like, what the heck? Music and therapy? Those two words together. I'd never seen those two words put together before. But because of my uh, me wanting to be a physician years, just a few years before being in the conservatory, I was like, this is interesting. I was able to cancel or p- postpone my rehearsal. And so I went to this event late. Uh, 
So I go into the room and it's this weird small performance room in the conservatory where you go in the door and the audience is facing you basically. <laughs> and so it's like, hey guys. yeah, like, oops, sorry, sorry. a little bit late over here. <laughs> so I walk in and then as I walk in, all the my friends that are in the audience basically, oh, Rich just walked in, walked in. She can do it. I'm like, what? I just walked in the door. I quickly found out that the music therapist who was from Australia was asking the audience if there was a piano major that could play You've Got a Friend by Ear. And none of them could do it. And they know that I play by ear. Voice major. Like, oh, there she is. There she is. She can do right it. Now yeah. As you walk in right. the door. Which I don't even know what this is about, right? So I go and like, fine, I'll play this song. And again, let me, I just want to contextualize. This is classical conservatory. You know, like we don't sing pop. If you sing pop songs, you're like, you're looked down upon basically. So I'm sitting at the piano but, and playing this song by ear by James Taylor. You've got a friend who I love. And this music therapist just leads everyone, all these classical music majors to sing together. And something I hate to use the word magical, but it really felt magical to be in this room singing together, not from a sheet, you know, and we're Mm -hmm. all just singing and you could, I could easily tell people were getting into it. And there was just this amazing energy just from singing. You've got a friend together. And then after that, I like, I get up from the piano. I'm like, what just happened? I sit in my seat and the music therapist proceeds with what an intervention that we know is a song discussion or lyric analysis. And I am, my mind is just blown moment by moment to make, make it even better. She starts to show pediatric music therapy by DeForia Mm. Lane. (laughs) And there you go. yeah, and that just seals the deal for me. I mean, I think I'm kind of teary eyed thinking about it because I remember vividly leaving that room in tears, thinking, where has this been? This is something that I need to do. It, excited that there's this profession, but also kind of grieving all the years that I had invested in doing something that I wasn't eventually going to do for the rest of my life. And then also kind of this, oh my gosh, how do I even do this? There's nothing. I'm in the Philippines. I didn't even know where to start at that point. So do you have any idea who that person was? Do you still contact them or? So no, I've been asking and asking when I went back to the Philippines last year and presented at the same school where I, you know, where I was at the conservatory, they couldn't remember who it was. And, and, you know, as a young music therapy student, I didn't really think to find out. Um, so no, I don't know. So shout out to whoever Australian music, music therapist therapy out angel. there. Yeah. I want to, yeah. I want to meet you and thank you in person, but I have talked to DeForia a few times about this and I've told her that she had been instrumental in, really sealing the deal for me. So at that point, you're just like, let's go. And then Mm -hmm. how do you find out Boston? How do you get over to Berkeley? What what goes on with all of that? This is back in the day when Google was just starting (laughs) in search engines. And so I just started searching music therapy. And I and I don't know if this is the case, but I, I feel like one of the first schools that popped up was Berkeley. And I had known about Berkeley. I didn't know how prestigious it was. Someone, another friend of mine, American, um, American pastor friend. It was actually, I think it was Dustin Janey that mentioned Berkeley to me. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And I didn't realize how prestigious it was. I just knew that it was a good jazz school. Yeah, and, I'm just going there. <laughs> yeah, like, and and yeah. he knew how I love jazz, so I was, I was like, okay, well, let me just see what this is about. Um, but when I started to look into it more, I realized that they offered a lot of scholarship money, and so I knew that 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 needed to happen. I actually applied for some scholarship before I applied to the school because I knew that that would make a stronger argument <laughs> for my parents to let me go. Um, and so I, they offered me some scholarship money and then I applied and got in and I, and also they, 
it Berkeley accepts a lot of international students. So that was a very important piece to me. I, I didn't want to be the only Asian, you know, or the only Filipino mm. student. And Boston is such a dynamic diversity. And so I knew that I wanted to be in that kind of place. And honestly, a good spot to land yeah, if you're going to do something. I honestly didn't even yeah. look anywhere, quite frankly. And so I got into the school, but um, my parents did not allow me to go for another two years. Mm. Yeah. Um, cause I, at that point was 18 years old. <laughs> they did, they thought I was still too young. Still a baby. Yeah. Still a baby basically <laughs> still. after already being college for, uh, three years. Um, and so they didn't allow me for another two years. And really what, what got them to allow me was Berkeley wrote back and said, Hey, you're going to lose your money if you don't come. So you need to come now. And they're like, fine. That'll yeah. <laughs> that'll do it. That'll do it. Yeah. yeah. And that's strong what took, arm. Yeah. That's what took me to Berkeley. <laughs> And that's, and I wish I could, you know, I didn't have this crazy, amazing story. There's, when I went to Berkeley, there were so many, I met so many incredible musicians where literally they had been playing jazz and just gigging and playing music with other people since they were like 11 or 12. I mean, I guess I could say the same that I had been playing music and I'd been surrounded by music, but I hadn't really been like into jazz until much later in life. Yeah, very different. Very yeah, different yeah, yeah. story. And so in a way it was overwhelming. But it was also, I'm glad that that happened because everything was new. And so it didn't, I didn't let it scare me because it was just, I just want to learn. I was basically like a sponge and I wasn't so intimidated by these people that had been doing jazz their whole life. So that's at Berkeley is really when I got into more contemporary styles, really singing jazz, started scatting, um, performing jazz, which I had never done, um, was featured in a jazz vocal series a few times and then writing my own music, which I didn't start until probably my later years in the conservatory. So I started to do that more. I started arranging more and that's at Berkeley is when I really fell in love with arranging, um, which I still love to do now. Um, and so it just really grew me so much as a musician, which I think positive, positively affected my skills as a music therapist. Yeah, I would say, I don't know, I personally don't know any music therapist that has more diverse musical abilities than you. Aww. So you've walked into uh, music therapy. What drew you specifically to the medical population? Well, the, it's probably comes from the fact that I'm comfortable in the hospital just because mm -hmm. of my personal background. And, and I started to find out more and more at Berkeley that there's even music therapy for NICU for neonate, neonates. And I was a premature infant. So that even fueled it even more. But I, I knew coming into Berkeley that I wanted to study music therapy. And I knew coming into music therapy that I wanted to be in the hospital because of what I described earlier as this affinity in the medical setting because I'm familiar with the environment. So that <laughs> took you eventually down to Orlando where you have been ever since. Yeah. So. That's a crazy story in itself because I had gotten accepted to Beth Israel for my internship, which I knew I wanted to do since basically day one that I found out about Beth Israel. Uh, probably my first semester as a music therapy major. Um, but as you know, I like, I'm a, I'm a devout Christian and person of faith and, uh, knew that I needed to obey God in my life. But at that point I was so focused on music therapy. That was my track. I was about to move to New York city and had gotten accepted when, um, family friends of ours, uh, at my old church, Orlando Baptist Church, this pastor was taking, uh, was coming back to be the pastor, and he was convinced that I was going to be the choir director um, months months before I had to move to New York City, and so I had declined. Uh, no, I'm not. Yeah, yeah like, and yeah. I had declined them a few times, <clears throat> and I didn't know about Florida Hospital, formerly known as Florida Hospital before, and so one of my professors, Dr. Peggy Cotting, who has ties with Dr. Jane Stanley from Florida State, told me that hey, there's this very new internship site in Orlando and they have a NICU program because at that point there weren't many hospitals that had NICU programs. It was only Beth Israel, 
Tallahassee Memorial and then this new hospital at, at in Orlando. And so I went because I was curious and I already had family friends down here and was accepted on the spot, but had to, you know, say, well, to make it all more complicated, yeah, I yeah. have this offer. Um, <clears throat> but the Lord knew, um, eventually finding out that my path is here in Orlando. And so I had to, um, find a replacement for Beth Israel and it all worked out and I didn't leave them hanging. But I mean, come to think of it, you know, like what would have happened if I didn't come? Because now I was hired there after internship as a second music therapist. And then now there's 11 of us that I manage at Advent Health. So, and you're the last one standing of the original ones. Yes. The OGs. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) and people have become come before and after you, and you're yes. still the pillar of that. So I love hearing you explain to whether it's physicians or nurses or whatever medical uh, personnel, I love hearing you tell them about music therapy. So how do you explain oh, it to gosh. someone from, from that background? That's pressure because I feel like it changes every single time. Um, That's okay. You can improvise, right? You yeah, can I definitely can. Um, okay. <laughs> music <laughs> so therapy. I tell you about music <laughs> Yeah, I'm not Kurt Dowling. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Real percussive. Um, so I, I would probably say I'm a music, I'm a board certified music therapist. And as a music therapist, I uh, use music in a clinical and very specific way to meet a person's individualized goals. And that could mean. Um, managing their pain. It could be working on their neurological functioning. It might mean that uh, we are working on their coping and helping them emotionally deal with whatever it is that they're dealing with in the hospital in this context of a relationship with a patient and myself as a therapist so that we're working together to really know what matters to them at this moment. So music therapy looks different depending on what the person's needs ear needs are. Sometimes it might be more receptive um, and they're listening to a song, but as a music therapist, I'm looking at their vitals and changing the way that I play the music to affect their physiological functioning in that way. Or I'm choosing a specific song for us to discuss or express something that they want to uh, feel or let out or work through. Or it could be a stroke or a TBI patient, and I'm using rhythm to help them regain their gait and uh, regain their attention or cognition or executive functioning. But it could also mean that I'm working with a child that is dealing with a terminal illness like cancer and I'm using music to just meaningfully connect with them or connect them with their family or just make music because that's what matters in that moment. So it's quite wide uh, and the applications are so broad, but it's very individualized depending on what the needs are. So I love exploring all the different music therapists who've already been on uh, because your role is even a little bit different than the last people that people have heard from. So what do you actually do on a day to day? Yeah. So I, my, my role is mostly administrative now. Um, A lot of it is program development. And so meeting with leaders and advocating for more music therapy or talking about the impact of music therapy in the different areas that we serve, it could be uh, talking to lay people or unit leaders when they say we need more music therapy and finding out how we could fill those needs. It, it I'm also the internship director. So a lot of my time is involved with uh, interacting with universities, uh, looking at applications, but also supervision with uh, our interns. And um, they have direct supervisors in the different units that they go to. Uh, but they also have time with me where we process uh, their clinical progress and, you know, all the things and issues that come up with internship, as well as teaching them some very practical musical and clinical skills, but also managing a team of uh 11 music therapists in the different areas of Advent Health. And and as you know, we're literally everywhere. So from any unit that you can think of, 
pediatric and adults, right? Med surge ICU. Uh, now we have inpatient rehab, a f- full music therapist just for that. We have hospice music therapists. We have an outpatient peds uh, rehabilitation program. We have a robust outpatient oncology program. And so really making sure that all of our therapists have the equipment and the resources that they need to be effective in their job. But also from a from a supervision standpoint, as the more experienced therapist, being able to have a person to problem solve with and work through some clinical issues or barriers that each of these therapists have. So it's quite wide ranging what I do on a day-to-day basis. What are all the different units that your therapists are a part of? Um, I mean, uh, broadly, yeah. So med surge for both pediatrics and adults and uh, progressive care, all the intensive care units, which we have lots of different subspecialties at Advent Health. So it could be multi-system ICU or cardiac ICU or neuro ICU, neuroprogressive care, neurosurgery. Uh, we have a robust transplant uh, team. And so we see a lot of patients in the cardiac floors in the adult world, as well as in a pediatric cardiac unit. Um, we also have a robust epilepsy program and we have what we call post-op day two consultation. So two days after brain surgery, the, the epi team is very good about um, putting in an order for music therapy. And so we see them in the neuro floors. And then we just started, uh, we just opened up um, an inpatient rehabilitation uh, two restoration centers is what we call them. Um, and so we have music therapy there, two individual and group music therapy sessions. Aside from our hospice music therapy program that covers inpatient units, facilities, and homes. Oh, what would sorry. You say- and we also have psych. Go ahead. We have psych both in behavioral health, which we're increasing services this year, by the way. Behavioral health, outpatient – oh, residential, not resident, what am I talking about? Behavioral health center and inpatient med psych unit. And then we also have a Parkinson's outreach program that we provide services for. In your mind, when you're talking with all of these leaders across the hospital, what are you, what do you think are some of the most compelling pieces of evidence or stories that show why music therapy matters in the hospital setting? I think when we talk to them, it's important that we give uh, we give data from coming from different sources, right? So knowing your your audience, obviously the, to the hospital, <clears throat> excuse me, research is very important. So we must show them that music therapy does work in these populations that we want to get into or that we're already currently serving. So we're lucky in music therapy. We're probably one of the most researched creative arts therapy modality. Mm -hmm. And so usually a lot of people get impressed by that, that we actually have Cochrane reviews, which is nice. Um, Even if they're not stellar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) They're still there. (laughs) So presenting that part and then always um, showing – anecdotal evidence or stories because our hospital is faith-based and our mission is really very holistic. And so it's important to always share stories about how I've seen it impact a family or demonstrate um, something that I've done in music therapy, like a a songwriting example that uh, shows how a patient was able to communicate their feelings and emotions or come to terms with an illness or something along those lines that's ha- that's happened in music therapy. And the other part of it is benchmarking. So which hospitals are doing it out in the world? Um, they're always curious about that because no one ever wants to be the last, right? And so anytime that the hospital can see, oh, this other hospital is similar in size and they have music therapy and this is how they're applied, okay, so that exists somewhere. But I think at Advent Health too, there's a certain – with any hospital that uh, whose vision is to be world-class, right, they want to be leading in something. So compiling all of these different types of information and data can really have a compelling effect when you're arguing for the value and benefit of music therapy. You also talked about something a long time ago that ties directly into your master's studies and your thesis. You said, 
I think that music educators should be the best musicians. <laughs> and what's funny is I know that that little flame that you had then has carried on a long time. And just tell us a little bit about what you did for your master's research project. Yeah. So we had all these different options, right, for for our thesis. And I knew I'd already done research at the hospital. And so I really wanted to challenge myself. And I've had this idea, which, you know, you've heard me talk about this a lot. We've solved the world's <laughs> problems at lunchtime yeah, many, I know. many, many, many lunches, times. Many but, you know, you've heard me talk about this idea of musical integrity, right? And, um, I've just been chewing on it for probably 10 years now, Chris. And I was like, maybe I could write something about it or try to define it or even find out if I totally just stole that terminology from someone, which by the way, as far as I know, I, I coined that as far as I know. Yeah. And so. Come at me, bro. Yeah. <laughs> um, the original idea was maybe I could write a philosophical paper but then um i after some mentorship i realized that th that seems like too big of a of a project for a thesis and so as i started to talk a little bit more to people and then talk to you remember i talked to you and jt and then our experience as internship supervisors and the barriers that I've encountered when teaching students that come from different backgrounds, different types of training, and they come to the medical setting and they have to contend mm. with a lot of things, not just clinically, but musically. I mean, there's lots mm. expected for music therapy students, right? They have to be able to sing and play the guitar and play the piano, regardless of what their primary instruments are as musicians. Whether or not they started on oboe. Right, they still right. Have to, yeah. And some of them didn't start playing the guitar until they started music therapy school. And technically that's, de depending if you're undergrad or equivalency, it could mean three years or it could mean one year out of internship. Right. And for most of them means 18 plus right. as well. Right. And so aside from that, learning instruments, there's this pressure of building repertoire when working in a hospital like ours, which we literally work with zero babies, zero age, two. Yeah, like technically right, negative. Like negative. Like they right. Have been born right. for months. To yeah. to like elderly. And so you're thinking quite a wide range just in music over there and then improvisation which is a big part of my approach as a music therapist and so for probably so I've been a music therapist now since well, for 12 years and um, I have been teaching interns for the majority of that probably 11 years and so I just started to look back at my experience and 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 realize that there's this thread um as i was thinking about what i was going to talk to you about like I, I started to like form it more in my head that there's just been this thread of how can i i've been always i've always been passionate about how can i impart what i know about music but also learn from different people's experiences about music so that we can just all be better musicians and not just Music therapy, that's obviously a big part of that. But how can I connect people with music? And that's a huge part mm -hmm. of my philosophy anyway. And so from that perspective and in talking to interns, getting some information from former interns, getting some information from you guys or my colleagues, I started to think, how, what if I create a course that bridges the gap between what most schools teach is classical theory, right? What mm -hmm. we know about theory, classical theory, and how do we bridge that into utilizing those skills so that we can learn popular contemporary repertoire really well and not just like, you know, put the same amount of respect that we would put into learning a classical piece of music into learning a contemporary song, and then from there, how can we use that language and that vocabulary that we build in learning contemporary music into applying it into basic improvisation? And so that's how this project transformed, basically. So what are some of the kind of central tenets? You talk about musical integrity. What does 
what does that mean the way you see it, the way you take it all in? So in not, not in my thesis definition, but in my own words, it's really basically keeping, how can we keep the music uh, good <laughs> to, to simplify it, right? High quality. High quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can we make the music high quality, but still relatable to the people that we work with, but be true to who we are as musicians. And what what's funny is I find out a lot in the way that I that I train interns. They're supposed to be these music therapists that have a handle on guitar, right? But mm-hmm. they would never think of themselves as guitar players, or the guitar doesn't feel natural to them for years. And so how can how can we make who they are as musicians be transferred into playing something like the guitar that may not feel so natural right away and and make mm. it more natural and how can how can i keep the integ or i can keep the music that we share in the moment with clients and with patients really high quality really good but relatable and I'm using my skills that I have built for many, many years and not just I learned to play an F chord. You know what I mean? Yeah. So deep diving for the music therapists who are listening, whether they're students, professionals, young professionals, seasoned professionals, if they're recognizing and resonating with what you're saying, what are some of those steps that you recommend first for <clears throat> finding that in themselves. So the course is laid out basically. So it's like a regular semester course and it's laid out into three different sections, I think. And I don't have it in front of me. So it starts at first what we would probably think of kind of like an assessment, right? And so it starts at first with how are aware are we in how we connect with music and so there's a couple exercises to that. First, in the course, um, I ask the participants to play a song that maybe, or pick a, so a couple selections. One might be something that you grew up listening to or special to you, and then one that maybe describes how you're feeling currently. And then you have to record yourself two different ways. So one record those songs by playing your principal instrument. So for example, you, Chris, your principal instrument is a guitar, right? So Mm -hmm. um, give me a song that's meaningful to you growing up or just maybe it's in the top of your head currently. The first song I remember deciding that I liked Mm -hmm. was What a Wonderful World. I was like four years old and I remember saying, you know, that's my favorite song. Perfect. Just because I liked Louis Armstrong's voice. That, that's great. And and that I like that because you connect with that on an emotional level. So I'll ask you to, okay, record yourself just playing guitar. Do not sing just pl- however you would play it on the guitar, whether you decide it's melody, whether you decide you're um, playing rhythm and with some melody, well, however, it, and then you listen to yourself doing that. And then you assess yourself. Do I sound like how I felt, right? Because the whole, mm. the whole point is play it in a way that you're connecting with it. And so now you're hearing what that sounds like. And then the second way is record yourself using our quote unquote music therapy instruments, right? So mm-hmm. same purpose, play it like you were connecting with it emotionally, but now you have to play it with your voice and your guitar. So record it and then listen back to it and see, did it sound the way that you expected it, the way that you were feeling it in the moment? So that way Mm -hmm. you know where you are, right? Because that's really the best way. We need to make sure that we know where we are musically, what our musicianship is very realistically. From there, we go to kind of like a, a quick, this is what you learned in theory. This is how we would apply it when we're analyzing. In- or maybe what you didn't really learn, <laughs> but this is what was said in class. Sure. Yeah. Which I find that a lot, actually, when I'm teaching 
interns and I'm referring back to theory classes and sometimes there's such a big disconnect that they didn't realize that that's what that was for. Oh, that's why yeah. I learned that is because I applied in this particular moment. Um, and, well, and they're 18 and no one's right. making those connections for them. And they just think I learned ha- this thing about counterpoint in Bach. You know? And it's just for that. And it's just yeah. for Bach, right? Which they don't know that music, there's more uh, in music that's just being refer- referred, referenced throughout yeah. throughout the years. And so what we do is we obviously in my thesis I write about how as music therapists, most of us live in a contemporary music world. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. But most of us are trained when in, in when we were in music therapy school, we were trained classically. Right? And so yep. we're not Absolutely. making these connections and so basically I I say these are some recommended repertoire Makers make a goal for yourself in terms of how many songs you want to learn weekly. And then I teach a method of how to study and learn contemporary music using the skills that you learn in classical theory and classical ear training. So what, what does this mean? You have a song right there with you. You learn by listening first. You don't even touch your instrument for a while. And so you re- repetition, you listen to music over and over again. And each time you listen, you're listening for a different thing. So the first thing- You call that the Phoebe Buffet method. <laughs> I don't, the Moats, let's just say the mo- the Ram method, <laughs> the Moats mo- method. <laughs> yeah, and so the first time you're listening to uh, the melody, for example, it doesn't have to be this exact systematic way, but I'll give you the different examples of what you're listening Whatever to. Whatever you're taking right. in the most. So first yeah, melody, yeah. and you'd have to write either you want to solfage it, actually write down the notes, or you doodle the melodic contour so that it's the first time. And by the way, you're not singing along. You're listening. The second time, now you're listening to harmony. And this time, I encourage students to use the Roman numerals. Right. So what you learn in mm-hmm. theory class, uh, one, four, six minor, a deceptive cadence, a two, five, a five, like these types of things engage that. So you're really teaching your ear to hear for these nuances that are present in every genre that we're learning. Mm-hmm. So after you go through that, now we'll, let's talk rhythm. And I'm listening to the rhythm section. I'm listening to the relationship between the bass and the drums. I'm notating rhythmic patterns, which you might find this specific rhythmic pattern is actually present in a lot of the similar songs in this umbrella genre, right? So that, okay, after all of that, now we go to learning the melody by rote. And I teach Same kind of situation. You play the first part, you sing it back until you can literally sing the whole song a cappella without even touching an instrument. Because what I've found when I've been teaching interns is that when they learn songs, they automatically pick up the guitar. Automatically. Which is funny because- Even if they're not a guitar. Right. Yeah. So I was about to point that out. And I'm like, why? Why? And that becomes a crutch. And so what this method teaches is, you know, you can, you're, you're listening and then you're able to audiate that then when you pick up the guitar, you might find that you actually already know how to play that rhythmic pattern naturally because your brain has already done that work. And by yeah, the, you let it, do you, the let, yeah, you yeah. let it, you literally let the music and your brain do the work. And so by that time, you're not really even intentionally memorizing the song, but really by the time that you've learned the song, it's also already memorized. So that's the so, one method. And from there, we take it to how do you use these same genre of vocabularies within these different genres? And how can you adapt your repertoire? So like, what if you played a pop song as a reggae song? How about if you played a country song like a lullaby? How about if you played an R&B song like a country song based on what you learned from the repertoire building section? And then from there, 
you take that same information and apply to how could you improvise. So I, you, you've heard me talk about using form, right? So A, B, A, B, A, A, B, A, C. What if you were mm-hmm. tying in a blues with an R and B, so a blues and an A and an R and B and a B, and how can you transition back and forth? So it's really not so much enlarging strum patterns, which is very common yeah. in our education, but it's really enlarging your vocabulary and listening to let letting the music teach us and letting our vocabula- vocabulary grow mm-hmm. that way. All of that has been very helpful now that I'm headlong back into uh, <laughs> academia. <laughs> and now I have 11 practicum students this semester. Fun. And it's uh, just the whole like, well, I understand you learned that strum to go with that song. Right. But that's not how that song sounds. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm like, I. It's like, and if you're going to dig your heels in, I'm just going to (laughs) play Apple Music right now and show you. That's not how that sounds. So, But isn't it that funny, uh, though? You remember a rep master class when students are presenting their music. And you know if someone hasn't listened to it. Because then when you start to play it back to them, they're like, oh, yeah. It's just awkward. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's an awkward spot to sit in. Like, uh, I always hated that aspect of like, it's just clear it wasn't (laughs) you know like (laughs) it's like i'm not even mad i just don't really want to sit in this anymore and and so one of the things that i want to take i want people students especially if there are any that are listening what what i want them to take away is the difference between musical authenticity and musical integrity because those are two very different things what i want to teach here is not so much about you want to play it exactly how Elton John plays it. I mean, that's part of it. And it's part of it because you want to learn the song and all the nuances that go along with it. But you want to learn it so that you can manipulate it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's a thorough knowing, not just a reproducing. Right. You're not just reproducing. Absolutely. Which... I mean, I think it's one of the biggest problems facing the 21st century Mm. music therapy school because music is going to continue to get more diverse and the world is more and more connected every day. So cookie cutter approach to delivering musical experiences is not going to cut it. And I mean, you know, because you worked in pediatrics for four years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, just the things the teens like year after year got wilder and wilder. And then, you know. And it's harder and harder they, to recreate. <laughs> yeah. It's harder to recreate when literally someone is on YouTube and they tell me about this YouTube singer. And next thing I know, Billie Eilish is the biggest right. thing in the world. Yes. And I literally just had like a 16 year old tell me three years ago about this. <laughs> this random girl in her basement and you can't keep up. There's no keeping Mm -mm. up in the, in the repertoire. You will just, you will drown because the water is rising and you can't swim fast. Uh, You have to learn how to think and approach and, and like you said, be authentic because you can only be you. And if you bring you into what it is and what you're bringing is, um, you know, good, like you said, high quality, you're inviting that person not to, at the end of the day, reproduce whatever that right. is, but to be them. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you pointed that out because I think just from my philosophy and my approach to songs are great and they're very meaningful. There's this amazing quote by Ken Brucia about songs and what kind of role it plays in our lives. And I tr- really, truly believe that. But we also can't just minimize our patients and our clients to just the songs that they listen to and that they like, right? There's so much more music in each and every human being. And there's so much more creativity that sometimes we, we as music therapists become the barrier to that creativity. Yeah, because it's a, it's the same analogy of people are not a, uh, 
if you ask me all the things that I do for fun, that does not equal Chris. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, All the songs that that person liked does not equal music, you know? Yes. So, uh, especially in a field where we're called not to be a record player. Exactly. Because Because we're not. There are plenty. Yeah, we're not. And plenty of people could do that amazing, but that's not what we're called to do. That's right. Well, in the effort of not going all night long i know all uh, night long. <laughs> your sweet husband is waiting for us to get because <laughs> you know us so we're, can go I, to bed. as old people we go to bed at 10 <laughs> you act like i wish i wasn't already asleep <laughs> um so to to kind of round it out i want you to answer the how and the why mm. and that's how and why do you inspire people to make more music. You can answer it in whatever order you want. I inspire people to make more music by being authentic, by listening, and by giving off myself as well. And inspiring with my musicianship to draw out other people's musicianship, whether they think they're musicians or not. I believe everyone's a musician. And the why, why do I do that? Because that's what makes us human beings. We are amazingly created, uniquely created to respond to music in ways that we're not even aware of at times. Um, And so Music is just a special gift. It's a gift, but it's also intrinsic. And so I m- music just transcends so many things, and that's why I like to do that. I want people to make more music. I want to create more and more music, not just as a music therapist, but just as a person. Well, where do you want to point people? This is where I tell everybody to get out their surfboards, Ugh. wax them up, because hey. they're about to surf the World Wide Web. Where do you want them to find you? Or what you're doing or where do you want to send them to? I wish I was better at this. Um, But you can find me on the gram. And the fact that I said the gram, um, I'm so hip. (laughs) Um, At R.A. Motes. At R.A. Motes. I also R-A-M-O-A-T-S. I'm also on Twitter, but I'm not on that all the time. But I do check it periodically. And I'm also on Facebook. So add me on Facebook. uh, Rich Abante. Motes, A-B-A-N-T-E. And my last name is Motes, M-O-A-T-S. And we'll send them to a good link about um, Advent Health Music Therapy too. So Yes. And I have a gospel record out from a few years ago that I did. It's on um, Apple Music. Um, and it's also I also did one with my old choir at our old church. And it's also on Apple Music somewhere. So... Fun. Well, we got to ring the Ken Brucia bell. I need a yes. sound effect. That was that was the second ding of the Ken Brucia bell. <laughs> so, um, well, Rich, it's been awesome just catching up a little yes. bit, and um, I'm sure I'll have you on again talking about something else. Uh, but for tonight, I just want to say thanks everybody for listening, and remember, give more grace, share more love, and make more music make more music all right i hope you enjoyed that chat with rich it's always good to catch up with her she is a beast of a musician so you should follow the stuff she's putting out now during the coronavirus with the advent health and just check out everything she's doing um, in the future too because she like i said is a monster i'm grateful for all that i've learned and the friendship i have with her so with that, bum bum ba da, we've wrapped up season one of Make More Music. And that probably means absolutely nothing to anyone but me because I'm mostly using it as just a division in my mind as I start launching some cool new things. So keep an eye out next week and on our social media on Instagram at make.more.music. I'm going to have some updates, some cool things coming out because, like, for example, you. If you didn't know, if you're just listening to the audio, you can watch this on YouTube and you can see me live interacting, right? And if you're there, I would love if you give it a thumbs up, 
subscribe, hit the bell icon so you know just like the podcast listeners that subscribe. And if you don't subscribe on the podcast, you should do that and leave a rating and review. I hope this has been super cool. I've got a lot of great interviews coming up and I have a brand new segment like I tipped off at the beginning of the show today. Today I have a new new music music shout shout out from one of our listeners, Marble Empire an electro pop artist out of the UK. Uh, He connected with me and we set up this chat. I was like, hey dude, let's play this song, this new song, Hold Me Up, that comes out actually this Wednesday. So this is the pre-release, a worldwide exclusive. Um, So electro pop, cool grooving uh, synths and cool stuff going on. Marble Empire is based out of the UK. You can find all of his info and uh, his updates about the upcoming song, Hold Me Up. And you're going to hear that instead of my regular bumper today. So everybody remember, give more grace, share more love, make more music. Back when we was 18, call you all my main thing. Go for my friends, things smoking like a daydream. We were so tight, stepping in light, light every day till sunrise, you know. Driving is the life, a hey. cigarettes and playlists. I've been thinking about all the best bits. How did it end? Never too mad. 